All right, everybody, welcome back to General Psychology. I'm your professor, Ryan Keith. In a previous mini lecture, or couple of mini lectures, Battling Biology Parts 1 and 2, I showed you a technique that I use to help you learn the different parts of the brain and how neurons function together. Um, basically, this focused on practicing drawing and understanding how um, the parts of the brain work together or how parts of a neuron work together. Uh, understanding how these things work is a lot better than memorizing them because then you add in the semantic encoding that you learned about from the memory chapter. You really understand it. There's something to help you remember. It's not just a list of terms that's difficult to remember. Today, I'm going to expand this to a few new areas as well. The first thing I'm going to do is show you how to draw a nervous system map. If you remember from my recording before, different parts of the nervous system that function together tend to be located together. Uh, so a map of how these things are connected to each other is really helpful in understanding what it is they do and how it is they function. Um, in addition, I'm also going to include some new information from your chapter on sensation and perception. I'm going to show you how to draw pictures of the eye and of the ear. Understanding how these parts work together are fundamental in understanding how these senses work. Um, these will go, of course, hand in hand with the mini lectures on vision and hearing that have to do with um, how weird your ears are and how it is that other animals see things differently from how we do. So at this point, I'm going to switch over to uh, my tablet here where I'm drawing my terrible pictures. Keep in mind, fuse a, bit, a few basic principles. You're not going to do this perfectly on the first try, and you're not supposed to. Uh, focus on practicing and getting better as you're practicing. Um, second of all, your pictures are probably going to be pretty bad. Um, they're they're going to be better than mine, uh, but it's not the quality of the picture that matters. It's being able to draw that picture. Because again, once you can draw it from memory, uh, identifying the parts and explaining what it is they do, then you are super duper solid. So uh, without any more ado, I'm going to switch over now and show you guys a uh, nervous system map as well as a uh, picture of the eye and picture of the ear. Okay, so I'm going to take mercy on you guys for the first option here, um, for the first example, which is doing the nervous system map. And rather than forcing you to watch me uh, draw squiggly lines and try to um, <laughs> write with my terrible handwriting, I'm just going to use some free online mind mapping software to do this. Um, if you haven't used mind mapping software before, I mean, you've seen flowcharts and mind maps before, but if you haven't used software like this before, they tend to be pretty easy to use. There are lots of them that are free to find online or to download. So a lot of times when I'm trying to practice something like this, I'll just open up a web page and get down to it. Um, this one is called Mind Mup, M-U-P, uh, but it just happened to be one of the first options when I searched for mind mapping free online. Um, so on a, a on a, a blank canvas like this, our main goal is to say like we're going to start with the most general stuff and break it down into more and more specific stuff. So for us, the most general division of the nervous system is the nervous system itself. Right? We know that the human body has a nervous system. And then, um, and a lot of these have different options for you know, child nodes or sibling nodes. All this means is, is it going to be something below it or beside it? So for this one, we're going to go ahead and uh, create a child node and say uh, one of the different divisions of the nervous system is going to be the central nervous system, which gets its name, of course, from all of the central parts uh, where it's located in your body. And then right next to that, we're going to put the peripheral nervous system. Just like your uh, peripheral vision is in the sides of your vision, your peripheral nervous system is in the uh, sides of your body. It's everything that goes from your uh, spinal cord all the way out to your fingertips. And then what we're going to do is break each one of these down into more and more specific parts. So for example, the peripheral nervous system has itself two main subdivisions. One of those subdivisions is the um, somatic nervous system. You may be familiar with the term soma, meaning cell body, and that's because the term soma means body. So whether we're talking about the soma of a cell, uh, we're talking about uh, the somatic nervous system, which has to do with the part of your nervous system that uh, controls voluntary movements of your body, or we're talking about uh, somatic topic maps in the brain, or the, your somatosensory system, which is uh, the, the sensory system that's involved in feeling your body, your touch. That word soma comes back again and again. Um, now, right below that one, we can do a, what a sibling node for the other division of the peripheral nervous system, the autonomic nervous system. 
Um, you might want to say the automatic nervous system. That'd be wrong. Uh, but it gets you in the right direction. There's everything that's controlled uh, automatically. We would say that this um, nervous system operates autonomously, like an automaton or a robot. It operates on its own without any sort of intervention. And the autonomic nervous system has itself two main subdivisions. It has the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And this is where you can stick in uh, definitions if you want to to help yourself remember that the sympathetic nervous system, for example, is the fight or flight system. And the parasympathetic, this is the one that's operating probably right now while you're just sitting here studying, we think of as the rest and digest nervous system. And check it out right there. We've already got the whole peripheral nervous system laid out. Um, again, I've practiced this stuff a lot, but once you get to this point where you can do this from memory, and guys, I'm not copying this from somewhere else. I'm just writing this whole thing out on my own. Uh, once you get to where you can do this from memory, you know you've got everything you need to do well on the exam. So let's jump up to the central nervous system. The central nervous system has two main divisions. Uh, it has the spinal cord, and then it has, sitting right on top of that spinal cord, a really important part of the nervous system that we call the brain. Uh, even if you didn't know anything else about your nervous system, I am going to guess that you knew uh, the brain was part of it. Um, when we look at the, the spinal cord, uh, the spinal cord itself is uh, divisible into three main, maybe not areas, but we can talk about the three things that function within the spinal cord. Uh, we can talk about the spinal cord is made up of uh, motoneurons. These are the neurons that carry information uh, from your brain to your body about moving around. You have sensory neurons that are important for carrying sensory information from the body back up to the brain. And then we have interneurons. Interneurons are in the middle. They connect sensory neurons and motor neurons, and they're important for um, controlling reflexes when you need to be able to respond faster than your brain can think. Now, I'm not gonna put definitions for all this stuff in here because I'm just giving you examples, but watch through this, learn these parts, and then plug them back in. Now, this brain part is something that we've really already been through already, right, with the, the other battling biology drawing, but we're going to stick this stuff back in here so we can see those main divisions of the brain. Now, there are a lot of ways that we can break up the brain, but I'm going to divide it into three main areas. We're going to call it the uh, brain stem, which is sometimes, sometimes called the hind brain. Uh, we're also going to have an area called the subcortex. And then right up on top, that wrinkly part that everybody sees, we call that the cortex. Now, we've already been through a lot of these parts, but your brain stem is made up of a few main parts also. Right down on the very bottom, and it's funny, I'm seeing in my head that drawing that I make every single time I draw the brain. That's like, again, I haven't memorized this list of terms. I'm seeing this picture in my head. With the brain stem, I just start at the bottom. Remember where, in fact, if we want to do it, let's, let's remember that the brain is built bottom up. Let's remember those principles, right? Uh, brainstem, subcortex, and then cortex. The brainstem, if we start um, right down at the bottom, uh, we're going to start with the medulla. Remember that medulla is involved in controlling, or the medulla oblongata is involved in controlling the most basic parts of our functioning. And remember that within the medulla, whoops, created the wrong kind of node there. Let's try this again. Uh, we have the medulla. Remember the medulla controls the most basic kinds of functions. Um, within the medulla, we have the... Um, let me see here. Within the medulla, we have an area of the brain called the reticular formation. Remember, the reticular formation is really important for sleep because it's involved in wakefulness. It's involved in attention. It's involved as a sensory gate to keep us from hearing things while we're asleep. Um, in addition to this, we have the pons. Remember, the pons doesn't really do any of its own thinking. It's just involved in carrying information from one half of... Oops, involved in carrying information from one half of the cerebellum to the other. Remember that the cerebellum is involved in coordination. Um, I'm sure you've never been in this kind of a situation, but if you've ever been drunk and you have a hard time coordinating yourself, uh, you've got slurred speech, have a hard time standing up and doing things, it's because your cerebellum has been hit real hard by that alcohol. Um, the last part of the brain, or of the uh, brainstem or the hind brain that we can talk about is really the top part, the part called the midbrain. Uh, when I demonstrate the midbrain's functioning in class, what I usually do is I get everybody focused on something in the corner of the room looking away from me. And while I spout some nonsense about what the midbrain could do, lying the whole time, I uh, pick up a large book or a bottle of water or something like that, and I just slam it on the ground. And just like when you, you have a jump scare in a movie, um, you immediately, you jump up in the air and you turn and you look at it, right? And that's because the midbrain 
among other things, is involved in bringing information from your eyes and your ears in, providing output to your shoulders so that when something surprises you, you can turn and orient to it right away. Um, your subcortex, let's let's jump up from the brain stem to the subcortex. The subcortex has a couple of main divisions I want you guys to know about. I want you to know that it has the basal ganglia. Uh, there's some argument about exactly where the basal ganglia is, but I'm gonna call it its own division here. I want you to remember the basal ganglia is involved in reward, it's involved in movement. So when you go to do something, it's involved in that, and when you feel really good about what you did, like winning at the slots or winning a race, like getting something good, that's because of your basal ganglia. In addition to the basal ganglia, the subcortex also contains an area called the limbic system. Now remember, the limbic system is like your lizard brain. It controls all of those basic functions. Um, now, not as basic as like the brainstem, but really basic stuff like, um, uh, like homeostasis, like hunger, right? That's controlled for by the hypothalamus. And we know that right above the hypothalamus, like a hypodermic needle goes under your skin, the what's right above the hypothalamus is the thalamus. The thalamus is really uh, just a sensory relay station. I want you to remember it relays stuff all over the brain. In addition to the hypothalamus and the thalamus, um, I, we can also look at regulating really basic stuff like fear and anger, stuff that the amygdala is important for, uh, for processing. In addition to the amygdala, we have um, the hippocampus. Remember the hippocampus is uh, the memory center of the brain. Uh, I always think of like uh, a hippo in a graduation cap, like in order for a hippo to graduate from college, you'd have to be a really smart hippo, right? So I think of uh, the, the hippocampus being a, something that makes you smart, helps you remember. It's involved in memory processing. Um, there are other parts of the subcortex that we, we maybe could get into, but they're a little more specific than we'd normally deal with here. Things like the mammillary bodies, the fornix, um, the striate cortex and, uh, stuff like that. Um, an area that, you know, it could be debatable whether it's the cortex or the subcortex, but it's good for you to know about. Um, and you know what? I'll just get rid of it and talk about it in the, uh, right up here. Um, an area of the subcortex that I think it probably is good for you to know about is the, um, corpus callosum. Remember, the corpus callosum is not really its own area of the brain. It's a bunch of axons, axons from either side of the cortex, carrying information from one side of the brain over to the other. And speaking of the cortex, let's talk about that. Remember, the cortex is the outside part of the brain that everybody really sees. And if we wanted to, we could say, okay, the most basic division of the cortex is the left side of the cortex and the right side of the cortex, but we're not gonna do that. Um, instead, what we're going to do is look at how each half of the cortex has four main divisions, right? Um, and those four main divisions, of course, are called lobes. Starting at the front um, area of the brain, we can get in with the easiest one, which is the frontal lobe. Remember, the frontal lobe is your do stuff lobe. That's the basic thing. If I ask you what the frontal lobe is for, you'd want to say it's involved in doing stuff. Whether we're talking about planning things out or producing language or even um, kicking a soccer ball or a football, if you prefer, uh, your frontal lobe is involved in doing that stuff. Right behind your frontal lobe is the parietal lobe. Um, remember how your parietal lobe is your maps lobe. That's its basic function. All sorts of maps are located in the parietal lobe. And right behind that parietal lobe is your occipital lobe. Uh, that's an important one we could talk about for this chapter because your occipital lobe is dedicated to vision. Man, if you've ever wanted to know just how important vision is, you got one quarter of your cortex dedicated just to that, right? That's nut stuff. Um, and continuing in a circle, right when we get around to our ears or our temples, uh, you have your temporal lobe. Um, and we could look at what each one of these does. We, we already talked about it in the, um, uh, in the, the uh, we already talked about it in the mini lecture on battling biology, but we talk about how the frontal lobe is your do stuff lobe, your parietal lobe is your maps lobe, your occipital lobe is your vision lobe, and your temporal lobe is kind of like your everything else lobe. It's involved in memory, it's involved in hearing, it's involved in language processing, stuff like that. So you see, relatively quickly, I've been able to lay out every major part of the nervous system that I would need to know for a class like this and what it is it does. You're not gonna have this the first time, but like I talked about before, write this out, draw it out. In fact, I'll go ahead and post this map right up there so you've got All right, thanks for sticking with me uh, through that long one. I promise these next couple of pictures aren't going to be nearly as long. Um, okay, so for the next one, 
Um, I'm gonna show you guys how to draw a picture of the eye for real. And what I want you guys to imagine is that for this picture of the eye, you are looking at it sideways. Um, of course, to add to the super duper quality of my images, um, I'm gonna be using MS Paint for this. So bear with me guys. So what I want you guys to imagine is that you are looking at somebody um, side view on like this, right? So somebody super ugly, just just like this dude right here. But what you're gonna do is imagine that you can see into that guy's eye right there. Okay, so let's put that away real quick. Um, and we'll get started. So uh, your eyeball is of course a ball, just like that, right? Um, and the goal of your eye, uh, most of us would guess, is to see, but that's wrong. That's only like a small part of what your eye really does. Um, the main goal of your eye is to uh, focus light. And as we go through drawing a picture of the eye, you're going to see exactly what I mean by that. Um, so when we look at your eyeball, like only, only a small part of it is involved in seeing. And when we look at your eyeball, remember what your eyes do is they detect light. Um, you don't see something by going up and pressing your eyeball against it. You detect it because the light emanated by the sun or a light bulb or a candle, something like that. Those uh, photons, that light, it reflects off of the object and enters your eye. So we have some light coming into our eye this way. And the first thing that light is going to pass through is a part of your eye called the cornea. The main job of the cornea is to focus light. And you're like, okay, well, great, that's good. That is like the job of the eye and it's done. Um, really what happens is there's other focusing that happens in the eye, but the cornea is a, a bulge on the front of your eyeball. It's a bulge on the front of your eyeball that allows most of the focusing to happen right there. It allows you to look at an image that's, you know, six feet or eight feet or 10 feet tall and wide and narrow it down to about an inch and a half on the back of your eyeball. So that cornea does most of the focusing on your eye. Next, as this light passes through um, in your eye, and I, you know, I should really make this appropriate for here. Um, the next thing it does is it passes through an area of your eye called the pupil. And what your pupil really is, you might say like it's that little black dot in the center of your vision. It's not. Um, your pupil is a hole in your eye. Um, it's a hole right in the center of a part of your eye called the iris. That's why I went ahead and drew it blue like that. Because if we were looking at your eye front on, you'd see that, you know, for somebody like me, I've got blue eyes. You'd see your iris is like that, right? And um, you've got your eyeball around there and your pupil is this black area in the middle. It's not really black um, at all. It is a hole right there in the middle of your iris that light can pass through. The reason it looks black is because it's dark in your eyeball. Same reason that uh, your windows look black, right? They're actually clear the same way this hole is clear. Um, your windows would look black in the middle of the night. You, I mean, try it, go outside, turn all the lights off and your windows will look black. They're not really black, it's just dark inside. Um, so this light passes into your eye, right? And it goes through the cornea, which does most of the focusing down. It passes through the pupil, and the goal of that pupil is to control the amount of light that comes in. When it is dark outside, your pupil relaxes. It expands to let um, more light in. Really what's happening, that iris relaxes. And when it's bright outside, your iris constricts to make that pupil tighter to let in less light overall so that you don't blind yourself going outside in the bright light. Um, this pupil also allows you to focus on things better. Um, uh, you'll notice that uh, the pupil expands, um, and you can see this in other animals too, you can see it in parrots really well, uh, but your pupil expands when you're interested in something or interested in someone. Um, when you're talking to somebody that you're attracted to, um, they can pick up on it the same way you can pick up on when somebody is attracted to you. I mean, you'll notice things like uh, maybe they fidget, they play with their hair, they uh, turn their body towards you, their toes are pointing in your direction. Maybe they're saying things like, hey, I like you, maybe we should get a drink sometime. Uh, that's, that's usually a pretty good sign that people like you. But you're also picking up on really small facial signals, uncontrollable things like dilated pupils, which is why even though you think you've got it chill, even though you think you're like, playing your game just right and nobody's picking up on the fact that you got the hots for your friend's girlfriend. Yeah, no, they're, they totally got it. Uh, you, you cannot hide your pupils. So um, the light comes in through the lens, it, or uh, in through the cornea, it passes through the pupil in the middle of uh, your iris. And the next thing it does is the light is further focused by a part of your um, eye called your lens. Now your lens is really this kind of like roundish thing. 
Um, but these muscles on either side of the lens can stretch it out. Uh, so it's kind of like you're changing the shape of the lens from a ball, right? So it goes from being kind of ball shaped to being stretched out to be uh, flatter like that. And that allows you to focus um, on things that are close or are far away. Um, this is a really important thing because this is what allows us to focus on stuff that's right there in front of our eyes or that's really far away. So like um, something to be really cool, take a minute right now and um, hold your thumb up at arm's length. Look away from your screen and hold your thumb up at arm's length. And uh, take your other hand and cover one of your eyes. So what I want you to do is keep that thumb perfectly in focus and move it cl as close to your face as you possibly can while still focusing on your thumb. And get to right where you start to lose focus on it. And then I want you to move it just a tiny bit closer and force yourself to focus. And as you do that, you're gonna to start to feel this straining in your eye as you attempt to focus on this. And that straining is these muscles right here stretching out your lens to make it easier to focus on something. And ultimately, all of this machinery, go ahead, uncover your eye. Ultimately, all this machinery is focused on getting a nice, crisp, clear picture on the back of your eyeball where your retina is right here. Now remember, your retina is the part of your eye that's involved in seeing things. This is where those specialized neurons, those photoreceptors are, so that you can detect stuff like light. Remember that your best vision is right here in the middle, that area called the fovea. That fovea is where you have really good vision. Um, it's no accident, it's right in the middle. That's why we look directly at things when we're interested in them. Remember, you have much worse vision way out here in the periphery, okay? Um, these retinas, uh, your retina provides input to, well, let me do this, oh, this is great, to your optic nerve, which passes in your brain and goes uh, by way of the thalamus to your occipital lobe. Uh, so that does it for our picture of the eyeball. Again, you'll notice my picture is absolutely horrendous. It's awful. It's terrible, but it's not about a quality picture. It's about knowing how to draw this stuff. Uh, next, I'm going to show you how to draw a picture of your ear and how that works. So if anything, the picture of your ear is going to be the easiest of all of these to draw. A lot of times, um, your hearing seems like it's some sort of exotic ability because we don't think a lot about how it works. But once you look at it, it's really just like a bunch of levers and stuff. Um, when we look at your ear, what most people think of, and I want you to imagine, um, I want you to imagine that you are looking at somebody uh, head on, just like this. This is the same super ugly guy that we were looking at before. And I want you to imagine that you're looking at this ear right here. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and put him away and uh, we'll get started with an ear. So when we look at your ear, what most people think of as your ear is really only just one part of your ear, right? This earlobe right here is just like one small part of what your ear really is. Okay, really just one small part of what your ear really is. Um, in fact, it's one part of three main divisions of your ear uh, called the outer ear. And your outer ear involves the lobe out here. And if you wanna know more about those funny wrinkles, um, you should uh, watch the mini lecture on how ears are weird. And it involves right out there as well as your auditory canal in here. The job of the outer ear is simply to collect sound and funnel it into your head. That funnel is shaped uh, in kind of a funny way so that you can localize sound better, but it's all just about funneling sound, funneling these sound waves in your head. Remember, sound waves are nothing but vibrations in the air. And ultimately, what your ear is gonna try to do is turn those vibrations into something your brain can understand. So um, your outer ear is focused on getting stuff in your head, and next, we're gonna talk about this area called the middle ear. Or let me see if I can get this drawn. Okay, so the middle ear. And the middle ear is made up of um, a few main parts. It's in, made up of the tympanic membrane. Your tympanic membrane is also known as your eardrum, as well as the three bones of the middle ear, three on either side of your head, known as the ossicles. You may have heard of the ossicles before. Um, they are also called the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. If you want to be fancy, you can use the Latin terms. But the ossicles are the, the tiniest bones in the body, and they're shaped pretty much like that, right? Uh, my, my stirrup needs some work, I think, here. Um, 
it makes sense that the hammer would hit the anvil, right? So the, this guy would hit that guy. The, the hammer on the left would hit the anvil on the right. And then the name of the stirrup comes from its shape right there. And ultimately, the job of your middle ear is to amplify sound. I want you to imagine what's going to happen as this tympanic membrane vibrates back and forth. Right? As this guy vibrates back and forth with sound waves, it's going to move the it's going to move the as it vibrates back and forth, it's going to move the hammer back and forth. And as it pivots back and forth, that's going to move the anvil back and forth. And as the anvil moves back and forth, it's going to create a piston out of the stirrup right here. And that's really important because that piston force is what's going to allow you to amplify the relatively weak sound waves coming into your head into really strong waves in the fluid located in your inner ear. You can see again, my picture is really awful. Your inner ear is made up when it comes to hearing at least. Oops, let me get a better picture here. It's made up of your cochlea and the semicircular canals. Now, one of the things I need you to do right now is remember that these semicircular canals have nothing to do with hearing. They are part of what is called your vestibular sense or your sense of balance. And that vestibular sense is not something we're talking about in this video, we're talking about hearing. So we are gonna focus right here on this snail shell bad boy called your cochlea. All right. So right here where the stirrup meets the cochlea, there's a little window where it vibrates back and forth and it vibrates all of the fluid that is located within, oh, maybe I can make this really easy on myself, vibrates all the fluid located within the cochlea. And this fluid, it vibrates back and forth. Well, that's not what I meant to do. Or that. This fluid, it vibrates back and forth all the way through here, and that's ultimately what's gonna tell your brain what's going on. Now, if we were to unroll the cochlea, and we can't, but if we could, we notice some interesting things, right? So if we were to unroll it to look like that, the stirrup is right here vibrating. We would notice that the cochlea, the basilar membrane located within the cochlea, this set of neurons that uh, detect sound, it's tuned. It's tuned such that the highest notes you can hear over here at about uh, 20 kilohertz are located right over here, and the lowest sounds you can hear at about 20 hertz are all the way here at the tip which explains a few things. It explains um, why it is that we lose our hearing for uh, high notes a lot sooner than low notes, because when this vibrating is gonna vibrate the hardest at this end. So if you're listening to loud music, you're gonna kill your ability to hear high notes. It also explains why this area right here in the middle is particularly sensitive, this area that is involved in detecting the human voice. It's right there in the middle, and um, the membrane itself is tuned such that you can hear it. Ultimately, when we think about things like um, music, uh, and some of you may have experience with stuff like music theory. You know, music theory is all about math, all about explaining why it is uh, we like uh, certain notes as compared with others, why certain notes and chords work uh, while other ones don't. Ultimately, we're describing a couple of things. One of the things we're describing is cultural preference, right? There are certain sounds that we really like because we've been culturally uh, taught to like those sounds. But another thing that we're learning all about is the cochlea. When we learn about certain sounds going together, about certain notes going together, we're really talking about, when we learn about certain notes going together, we're really talking about how this thing works and which parts of the cochlea like to operate together. And then of course, um, this cochlea, I forgot to mention, provides output as always, through the thalamus, uh, but to the temporal lobe as opposed to the occipital lobe. All right, guys, thanks for bearing with my terrible drawings and uh, the little bit of a delay on getting this one up. But I really do hope that drawing these pictures is something that you'll find helpful in trying to tackle some of the more difficult material uh, we're going to run into this semester. So um, keep practicing, uh, work hard on studying for this next exam, and I'll look forward to seeing you guys online. Thanks a lot for your hard work.